one. Hello and good morning. Welcome to the Rare Disease and Disorder interview with Dr. Karen Herbs, a leading expert in subcutaneous adipose tissue diseases. Welcome, Karen. Thanks so much Thank for joining you. us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Now, a lot of people don't even know what that even means, adipose tissue diseases. A quick definition from you, perhaps. Sure. So subcutaneous adipose tissue is just one way of saying the fat on the outside of your body and fat by definition is loose connective tissue. So by definition, a subcutaneous adipose tissue disease is a connective tissue disease. And that's kind of easier to remember. It is. And I think it resonates very well with our listeners um, because everybody is focused, you know, on things like um, looking at their own, their current weight, their whole weight, looking at obesity rates within the country and, and throughout the world. So very relevant topic for today. And we've heard a, a numerous accounts that people are very um, concerned about the pandemic and how that has had an impact on their health in general. And one of those factors is, is looking at some, some of the weight issues going on there. So we want to make sure people really understand this, this topic. So we're so thankful to have you. And Karen, it, she has a leading practice, the Total Lipidemia Care Practice, both in Arizona and California, but is world renowned for her research and study of this particular um, area. And today we're gonna to be focused on four different um, rare diseases and disorders. So our goal for today is to learn from Karen about these four different subcutaneous adipose tissue diseases. And we're gonna be discussing how all four diseases are also known, and, and perhaps you could tell us the appropriate um, way to, to say adipofacial disorders, is that correct? Adipofascial disorders, yeah. Oh, I knew that that was probably pronounced a little bit differently. So if anybody is struggling with this disorder, this is a great way for us to learn a little bit more information about it. And if some of the information that we're sharing today resonates with you or family members, this is a great starting point because it can be one of those areas that's a little bit difficult to, to be on that journey with yourself or other family members. Mm -hmm. So. Let's get started. I first met Karen uh, just a few years ago when um, I was researching these diseases and disorders after my mother passed. So I was going through, and I don't know, Karen, if you rem remember me talking to you about all of this information that my mom had printed out along with binders full of health information. She was the queen of research and, and um, trying to figure out everything. Um, again, because we, we know sometimes it's a little bit frustrating when you have something that's more on the rare side to figure out what is this that I have. It must be rare because nobody can figure it out. Um, sometimes you just don't get to the right people. But that led me to a great conversation with you, Karen, um, where I had talked to you a little bit about my mom. And I've got a picture here of my mom with her dad. They couldn't be more opposite in body type. So this is my mom and her dad. And this is this is her dad's family way back when. And then this is my mom's mom right there, right here. And then my mom's grandmother. So you notice quite a difference between my mom's side of the family and her dad's side of the family historically growing up and they stayed very similar in in body structure and type and even similarities in some of the, the the different diseases so that led me to really yearn for more information about these things that my mother was so interested in and I just have a passion for all rare diseases and disorders so it is an honor to be talking with you today um, now you you did some research um, quite a bit of research and one of the things that I found was a article that you did um, not, not too terribly long ago where you looked at four different rare diseases. Can you tell us a little bit about that research and those specific, particular four different diseases? Sure. So that must be my um, endo textbook chapter that was published in 2019, and we can provide a link for that. It's 
uh, that book chapter is really directed at providing information on the different diseases, but also how do you care for people with those diseases? Because that's the information that a provider needs to help a patient. So I could start with the first one, uh, familial multiple lipomatosis, or we call it FML, definitely a rare disease, multiple lipomas on the body, usually on the trunk and the arms and the thighs, also the butt. And in families, someone can have a few and somebody else can have a hundred. And from Rebecca Campen's work, if there's weight gain in the family, some of those people can go on to develop painful lipomas. And then we call it Durkham's disease. So that's one type of Durkham's disease. And I call it the FML type of Durkham's disease. And basically the treatment for FML is just to have the lipomas removed. There is one known gene for it, and we can give that reference as well. And that gene also causes multiple different types of cancer, such as breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. So people shouldn't worry if they don't have cancer in the family, but if they do have um, you know, cancer, uh, different kinds, then maybe they should be looking at this gene if they do have FML. Oh, that's really important to know. And I like how you've distinguished the FML from the Durkhams, which was the number two one of interest. And so for my mother and my grandmother, and I believe also the great grandmother that I showed you pictures of, they all had these mysterious um, benign tumors with mm -hmm. strange associated pain throughout their bodies. And I think many of us know people that do have those types of tumors, whether they be lipomas or angiolipomas. Um, but I think that the key thing that you said was the pain association. What, what is it that brings about that pain? Nobody really knows but there are nerves within fat tissue. And you know you know that when you squeeze somebody's arm, you can feel them. If you yes. didn't have nerves, you wouldn't feel them. So fat can hurt just like muscles can hurt. And fat again is, is fascia. It is a connective tissue. And I think what's happening is when the lipomas grow large, First of all, if you have a fat lobule, which is multiple fat cells together, you have blood vessels that feed it and veins that lead from it, but you don't have any lymphatic vessels in there. So mm -hmm. the fluid needs to come out of those fat lobules and get into the lymphatic vessels downstream. If it doesn't do that, that lipoma has stagnant fluid. It gets inflamed. The nerves that are sitting within that tissue also get inflamed. Then you have pain. And um, usually your body starts to try and protect the nerve, but if you push on it, it moves that protection away from it and there's your pain. Oh, I've never heard anybody put it that quite that simply. And, and it is that simple to understand. So thank you so much for explaining that in that way. Cause I think that's but a easy way I to- I do think um, that people with chronic pain centralize their pain. So the body begins to create its own pain syndrome and I think that's what happens with a lot of patients with Durkham's disease. So it goes beyond just what's happening within the tissue. It actually involves the central nervous system as well. Interesting. And I think this is one of the, the reasons why this was so important for me to bring to the world, um, because it is, it is one of those things that um, without people such as yourself, Karen, and other leading researchers in this field, we really wouldn't have an understanding of that, as well as appropriate treatment plans that can really be a, a, a tremendous solution for those that are suffering with these types of diseases and disorders. They're often, they often go very misunderstood. You have multiple physicians that don't understand the disease themselves. So we'll talk a little bit about that and what we want other physicians to know as well as potential patients that may be struggling to find the appropriate treatment. Um, because you and I are both very passionate about this with some other um, you know, amazing people around the world that are, are trying to get the word out and that that's our goal here today is to get the word out about these rare diseases now do you think the diseases are really all that rare or do you think that they're just mis mis uh, underdiagnosed oh i do think that fml is rare okay and that that's i think it's pretty well established in the literature and i also think as you mentioned angiolipomas are also rare and angiolipomas are very vascular lipomas that often appear in young men, 
Mm. And they think in part it's trauma induced. So for example, if, if a young man plays football in high school and just gets you know, beat on right, often, right. Um, that may stimulate the formation of angiolipomas. Huh. And I, I, in some families, there's a genetic component, but in other families, there's not. So why does that happen? And I think it's because it's the way the body tries to heal itself. The angiolipoma is a marker of scar. When you damage your fascia, like, and let's talk about exactly what I'm, what fascia I'm talking about. So when you have a dense piece of connective tissue that covers the top of your muscle, mm -hmm. that's the kind of fascia I'm thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. And when that gets injured, it starts to undergo angiogenesis. It forms more blood vessels. And if you take a piece of that dense connect connective tissue and drop it into a Petri dish, it will grow fat cells. Really? even though it's connective tissue. So you combine the angiogenesis vessels plus the new fat cells, lipoma, you've got angiolipoma as a marker of scar. And so you need to heal that dense connective tissue over your muscle and also the, the connective tissue in your fat in order to have those angiolipomas heal themselves. Interesting. Again, just fascinating conversation. And I, I know that other family members and even myself have had angiolipomas, but again, I've never heard anybody explain it like that. So sometimes it's just about really doing your research, getting with the right physicians um, to really better understand what's going on within your body and figure out what to do next. And fortunately, we do have um, you, Karen, and other leading physicians to, to take us on those journeys and answer these questions and continue these re this research so that we can continue to learn more. Very, very interesting. Um, and also interesting that it's associated, you know, sometimes with an impact or some type of an injury, but mostly associated with males thinking maybe things like contact sports. Um, but yet I know many females that also have that same thing. So that's very interesting. That's uh, giving me some aha moments. Now, you were a University of Iowa grad. My son um, was a University of Iowa grad. I grew up in the Quad City. So how did you first start your interest with this subcutaneous adipose tissue diseases and just your journey um, that led you to where you're at right now? So I've been interested in fat ever since I was a kid. I found it... Uh, fascinating when uh, older women would be shopping in the grocery store and they had this big hanging fat fold from their upper arm. And I would look at my arm and look at their arm and I'd say, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at other people. I'd look at a mom and her fat tissue looked just like her daughter. Or as a man aged, he'd grow this big fat belly. Like, well, that's really interesting. I thought fat was all the same. I thought you got your fat and it just stayed there and it, it didn't do, it didn't morph. It either increased or decreased, but it didn't move around in the body in, in unusual ways. And so, so I, I, I went through uh, college at the University of Iowa and I was interested in everything. I mean, I like philosophy, literature, biology, Spanish, art. I mean, I just couldn't pick. And in my senior year, I took a course in cell physiology. And mm -hmm. that started to explain how the body worked. And I said, I need to know how the body works. That I'm, this is what I'm going to do. So I went on to get my PhD there in cell physiology. It was very basic research looking at aging. So how, when, as we age, our proteins start to get more and more errors in them. Mm -hmm. And if we could prevent that, well, we could slow down aging. And so I did a little bit of work there. And then I did a Howard Hughes fellowship after that. And I realized, you know what? I need to be around people. So I went to medical school and decided to go into endocrinology because people who have obesity can develop diabetes. And that's my connection to fat. And also I'm an endocrinology. You study blood fat. So I thought it was a good fit. And it was in our lipid disorder clinic where I met a patient with a fat disorder. She came in, she had familial partial lipodystrophy or mm -hmm. Koberling type of lipodystrophy, which is a, another rare disease. And I, I said, what is this? And I started reading about it and I'm like, oh my God, this is a fat disease. I'm like, oh my. And I went in the room and I swear to God, I fell on my knees in front of her and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad to meet you. And she probably thought it was insane, but that started my uh, journey. And I 
From there, I got introduced to Madelung's disease, which also is a rare disease of fat that primarily grows on the upper part of the body. And it's associated with heavy alcohol use, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I uh, got introduced to Durkheim's disease and then met um, women with lipedema and here I am. Now, do people that have Durkheim's disease, FML and Madelung disease, do, do they all have lipedemia within that? Or is that a separate category of disease? So yeah, so there's lipid, yeah, the naming of some of these diseases is unfortunate because they all sound like each other. So uh, lipedema is fat in women that grows primarily on the hips, thighs, and buttocks and the leg. Okay. Also 80% have affected arms, but the trunk, hands, feet, and head are unaffected. Mm -hmm. And that we think is more common, mm -hmm. but what I'm realizing you know, lately is that I think there's different ways that a woman can develop fat legs and we shouldn't just lump it all into lipedema. We have to be very careful how we pick patients and, and give them labels. And I, I really do think we have a lot more to learn in that area. And then there's a lipidemia, um, which is uh, when you have high cholesterol in your blood or high triglycerides in your blood. And then there's lymphedema. Thank so, you for clarifying those three because they are very different and people do confuse those. Yeah. So if, you, if you're a woman and you go into your doctor and say, I have lipidema, they might say, well, okay, well, we'll do a blood test and check your cholesterol and your triglycerides. No, 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 I have lipidema of my body. Yeah, I know, I know what that is. We, if you need cholesterol medication, I'll give it to you. No, so you, that's the important uh, reason why you need to bring in a paper or picture and say, this is what I think I have. Because I think when a physician sees it visually, they'll, they'll get what you're talking about. Well, we'll have to be sure to put some resources to do some explanation of each of those, because that is primary of importance for people to understand. What do you think, Karen, is the biggest mis misconception out there regarding obesity? It's talked about every day in every news channel, in every conversation. So what is the biggest misconception in your opinion? I think that most people think the way that you develop new fat on your body is by eating too much and exercising too little. And so when patients with a true fat disease, meaning that they cannot lose that fat by diet, exercise, or even bariatric surgery, they're, they're viewed as obese. They're eating healthier than I will ever eat. They're exercising more than I have ever exercised. And yet they still can't lose the weight. And their doctors say, you know what, you need to um, eat less and exercise more, which is impossible because they have to have, they have work, they have kids, mm -hmm. you know, and exercising an hour a day should be sufficient. So there are many, many, many genes that contribute to obesity. The problem is they haven't found like one main gene that explains everything. There's a few genes that, um, I guess account for about 1% of all obesity, but, and, and that's, that's a lot, but it's not 100%, it's not 50%, it's not 20%. So I think there's multiple, multiple, multiple ways that you can develop um, increased fat tissue and that doctors, I think, need to be educated a little bit more on fat. We're not, we're not given, we're not taught how to examine fat in medical school, at least I never was. Mm -hmm. And we're also not taught very much about the lymphatic system, which I think is really important in fat tissue and fat tissue, it, you know, is a way is it's our biggest endocrine organ. It houses a lot of immune cells. It's a way to keep us warm. It's a way to, uh, to help us attract other people. We're attracted to it in other people. It, it's just a multi-purpose organ in our body. And yet we learn so little about it. And you've used the term organ. Most people don't understand the terminology organ with that. that that's something that evolved. When, when, when was it first described as an organ? It's, well, it's, it's always been an organ. It's just that it's been an or, a throwaway organ. Right. So, you know, when you go to an autopsy, um, they dig, they just move the fat out of the way. And I, you know, I've been in at an autopsy and I said, no, 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 give me that. You know, and they just, they, it's viewed as just garbage, just throw it away and get down to the real stuff, like the organs and the muscles and the bone. 
I think that if we view fat as a beautiful part of ourselves, we might be able to change society's view of it. And I want to help you do that. I want, I want to help change that, that perception. You know, now, I, is there I, two types of fat? Is there brown fat as well as, um, and, and they, they do have two different purposes. Is that correct? Yeah. So when we're born, we have white fat and brown fat and animals have more brown fat than we do. Okay. And as we age, that brown fat disappears over time. It's still there. Um, and there's, there are brown fat cells scattered throughout our body, but primarily as adults, we, we have white fat. But if you live in a cold climate, you can generate more brown fat because brown fat is a way to keep us warm. Hmm. So I'm sure, you know, you've held a baby and you're like, oh my God, they're like a little heater. And, it, and that's not just because their heart's beating and they have warm blood, it's because they have a lot of brown fat and they're generating heat. And is there a way, if you, if you work out, for example, if you're somebody who's doing CrossFit and you know, you're, you're working, you're doing marathons and ultra marathons, would that produce more brown fat or not necessarily? Uh, not necessarily, because a lot of those people are super lean. Right. So they have very little fat and they need their, those fat stores as energy. Mm -hmm. But if you worked out in the cold then you would generate brown fat. I see. Interesting. We, we've got some marathon runners in our family and an ultra marathon runner. Um, so we're, we're always interested in looking at that. I could be wrong about the marathons, but I mean, that's not my area of expertise, but I do know that if you, you know, if you sit in the cold or run in the cold or work out in the cold, that'll generate a lot more brown fat. And I thought, you know, we should really be creating gyms that are really cold. Right. That, and, and instead of hot yoga, maybe it should be cold yoga. Cold yoga. <laughs> that is so interesting. I'm going to have to do some thinking on that one um, for sure. Now, if you um, think that you or a family member might have one of these four diseases or any type of a disorder associated with some of the things that we're talking about today, what do you recommend, Karen, as the first steps to take to confirm a diagnosis or investigate, um, you know, that with an appropriate physician and proceed with a treatment plan? So I think you, you need an understanding healthcare provider and it doesn't matter who they are. They can be a nurse practitioner, a PA, an MD, a DO. It, it really doesn't matter as long as they're interested in your health and interested in helping you. And that's why most people go into the, the medical field is because they enjoy helping other people. So I would bring a paper that has pictures that you can say, look, I look just like this. I looked at all these symptoms. This is me and share it with them. An understanding provider is actually going to look at it, read it and say, oh my gosh, I think you're right. I don't know much about this, but let me look more into it. Excellent. Excellent information. And I think when you get to the stopping point where somebody doesn't want to look at that, it, it might be time to just kind of continue to look and yeah, get a second opinion. Yeah, I get to get that second opinion is always very, very valuable. Um, well, that's great information. Now, as far as physicians, we, we know because you just mentioned that sometimes physicians aren't trained for this. This is something that's still being researched um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So as a leading physician focused on research, treatment and raised awareness, of these types of uh, rare diseases, what would you like other physicians to know? I guess I'd, I'd like other physicians to know that there are diseases out there where the fat becomes very fibrotic and it's very difficult to lose by diet, exercise, or bariatric surgery. And while I think um, all three of those are really great ways to treat fat that's developed due to lifestyle changes, such as a pandemic where you're just eating a little bit more and you're exercising a little bit less. There's other ways that fat can develop and it's, it can be genetic or it could be caused by something as simple as, uh, you know, lymph lymphedema. So if you have lymphedema of the leg, fluid sits within the tissue, that fluid is rich in nutrients and um, juices and the fat cells just love it and they grow like crazy. So someone with lymphedema that starts out just as fluid can develop fat over time. 
inflammation of that fat tissue results in fibrosis. Once that fat tissue is fibrotic, you cannot lose it any other way. You can lose all the other fat on your body, but not that. That fat actually needs to be surgically removed. So if physicians understand that fat tissue can become sick, and when it becomes sick, it's inflamed. When it's inflamed, it becomes fibrotic, and, there, and that fat is stuck on the body, we need to think of, of more unique ways of removing that fat tissue. And that's why uh, we've done research on deep tissue therapy to break down the fibrosis, compression garments to keep that fluid moving out of the tissue so it doesn't sit around and generate inflammation and fibrosis, and then also surgical methods. And as a, a, a medical physician, I'm not a surgeon, I want there to be more medical ways to treat fat. And that's kind of what I've focused on. Although I do support the surgical removal of fat tissue when it's necessary. Excellent information. And anytime I am talking to any physician, I'm going to point them right in your direction to continue <laughs> to get educated in this area because I think so many people, um, their, their journey is very, very difficult. I know um, not really knowing my great grandmother here, I heard stories about how she passed at a very early age. She had a goiter. So there's all these other associated you know, conditions that might come with this and, and might be misunderstood where my grandmother, I did know in my early years um, here at a holiday, but she died of a massive heart attack at a very young age. So I didn't know her very long. Um, and again, back then, nobody had this information that we have now, thanks to all the research that's gone on. But then when you have other family members, that looks so different than you. And you may have started in your early years looking very, very much like them and then kind of morphed into something. It's just very, very hard psychologically. Any last words on um, just a psychological journey that patients go through in staying encouraged and empowered um, during this time period of exploration? I think a lot of people have had very difficult journeys, especially uh, ones that have been disbelieved for 20 or 40 years. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, angst that builds up over time and you feel like you're a failure and you, know, you didn't do anything right and something's wrong with you. But mm -hmm. I think the wonderful thing about right now is that there are so many social media groups that are available where people can go and talk to other people and find out you have that too. Yes, that good. Too? that's good. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who have been on this journey for a long time and have developed a lot of knowledge. I get a lot of my knowledge from my patients. I think people with uh, rare fat diseases or, or and lipedema are very bright people. They know their body so well. They know what works for them. And, you know, I've, I've come up with some things on my own, but really I have to give credit for most of what I do to my patients. So those people are out there, they can help you on your journey and hold your hand. The only thing I'll say is that sometimes because some of these diseases come with chronic pain it is that, you know, it, it's been really difficult for a lot of people. And I think we need to, uh, you know, love them and just you know, keep giving love back, even when somebody might be angry one day or frustrated one day. Um, I think it, you know, we're going to have ebbs and flows in the way that we feel. I think we just need more understanding and more love giving right now because we're so separate from one another. Um, but I, I do think it's a better time now than it was back when these first these diseases were first described, well into the um, you know 1800s right? Mm -hmm. That's been a true. long time. Mm -hmm. And we do need more research into especially Durkheim's disease and angiolipomatosis and familial multiple lipomatosis. There's a lot of research going on in lipedema. And I think that's going to give us really good information that we can look at these other diseases with. 
Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. If things have just accelerated, I know even in the last few years, my, my knowledge has grown tremendously thanks to some of the things that I've even read on your Facebook post and some other research that I've read of yours and other leading experts. So I, I really want to thank you because this is something that, that we absolutely need to continue to look at. And like you said, just love on these, these, these patients that really could use it the most. Most. Well, I want to thank you, Karen, for this crash course on subcutaneous adipose tissue diseases. You've been a wealth of information, and we will be posting additional resources, as we mentioned, with the interview so people across the world can learn more and follow the growing body of research about these rare diseases. So thank you very much today. My pleasure. Uh, <laughs> and we encourage you to continue to share for people to join some of the groups that you're in to continue to learn more. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marilyn. All right.